before we dive into the word tonight, I just, I was thinking as I was preparing for tonight, thinking about all that goes into our Sunday night experience. And there's lots of people that are involved in that. It isn't just the worship team that you see up here or the pastor and, uh, and the parsha reader. It's a lot of other people and a lot of other teams. And so as you came in tonight, you experienced our first encounters team who work really hard at giving you a great first encounter and to welcome you and to set out coffee and to do the Connect Center and to make that experience a, a warm and a welcoming place. So we're thankful <clears throat> for all of those people and for our media and production team who did the video announcements and they work all week on that one just because of the bloopers and they put together all the slides that are going to be up there and they're doing the live videoing right now and lots of work that goes into that every single week and, and so it wasn't just today, they've worked all week long to be ready for today and our Kingdom Kids team putting together great lessons and then coordinating all of the volunteers to come and, and to be with our children and not just to sit with them, but to train them in the ways of God and to tell them about who God is and to, to give them an opportunity to have relationship with Yeshua themselves. And then our wonderful prayer team. Some of you are going to experience an amazing prayer team tonight. Right after service, they're going to join us right down here in the front. And they're going to pray with some of us through different parts of our lives. And they've been preparing their spirits and asking God how to pray for you before they even met with you tonight. And then you probably don't even know about our prophetic team. I found our prophetic team tonight by accident when I went to go get my shirt in the back room. And they were in there and they grabbed me. And they prophesied over me and they prayed over me. And every week this team comes together and they, they pray for God's word for us for tonight. And, and what does he want to share with us? What is his heart for us as we're gathering together? God, share that with us so that we can be prepared in our hearts and in our spirits. And then, of course, our wonderful worship team who uh, worked all day today to get ready and throughout the week putting songs and charts and chords together and getting right instrumentalists and we have the best worship in the world I think and for sure in Jerusalem we're so thankful for them and so all of you that work together to make today tonight happen thank you to all of the volunteers thank you to all the different staff we don't get an opportunity to say that from this place very often but we're thankful for you because you make this happen so can we give them a big hand we're so thankful for those people if you were with us last week pastor chad did an outstanding job uh, as he began to highlight for us some aspects and some attributes about who God is that we don't get to see or hear very often. As he started this new series that we're in, The uh, Visions of Amos, he began to highlight things about God that are important for us to capture and to understand, giving us this idea that God's driving motivation behind everything that he does in our lives and, and through our lives and in the world around us is to impact that intimacy with us. His desire for intimacy with his creation, with each and every one of us, drives everything that he does. And so even the, the best part of that message last week, last week was that even in our very worst condition, when we were at the, the height of our sin and, and darkness and separated from God, that was when he loved us even more and, and made provision to be able to come back into relationship with him and, and doing whatever it took to be able to eliminate the wall and the separation between us and him and, and moving in a way that is constantly chasing after those that are lost long-suffering in our lostness and putting up with lots of our, our faults so that he can find a way to come in and be in intimate relationship with us. This is in sharp contrast to the image that the world paints of who our God is. And, and often, even within the body of Yeshua, we get bad reports of who God is and we get a picture or a, a, a wrong understanding that God is the, this... Uh, angry God who doesn't put up with one shenanigan and he's looking for ways to step into our lives and mess them up and to punish us for stepping outside of the lines that he's clearly drawn on the ground and that he's not loving and he's not patient and he's not kind. And yet as Pastor Chad began to take us into the book of 
Rev- uh, of uh, Amos last week, we saw something completely different. We see a God of covenantal love whose heart is broken over the separation between him and his people and, and because of their rejection of their covenant with him, rejecting this intimacy that God had created for them as a people like no other people in the earth had. In fact, this was the very reason that God had chosen them, was to create a, a, a covenantal relationship, something that didn't exist ever in any place in the world then and doesn't exist any place else in the world till today except between God and his people. And so he created the Jewish people and, and brought them apart from the rest of the nations of the world so that when the nations of the world would look in on the Jewish people, they would see something different. They would see covenantal relationship. This is different than just the relationship between a, a person and another person and between gods and little g gods and people. This covenantal relationship is based upon commitment, a, a decision to be committed to the other person, de- devoted to them for their sake, for their goodness, looking for ways to love them, a decision to love and to serve and to give the very, very best parts of me sacrificially to make you better. That's covenantal relationship. And this is what creates intimacy because it doesn't exist anyplace else. So this is what God had desired for his people and for him. And we see Israel that they've rejected uh, this covenant. They haven't rejected a lifestyle. They haven't rejected a religion. They've rejected the intimacy of relationship with their God. And this is what broke God's heart. This is what tipped the scale, Pastor Chad said last week, and, and, and brought God to the place where he begins to prophesy through Amos coming judgment that's going to come upon the, the nation of Israel. So as we step into Am, uh, the book of Amos, this is what we find. God is with his people and he's broken because they've rejected this long-standing covenant. It isn't just a covenant that they've had for a few years. They've had it now for hundreds of years. And, and they've had it from that moment they stepped out of Egypt as slaves with nothing, with no name, with no hope, with no future. And God made them a nation out of nothing. And at the, the, mount, at the base of the Mount of Sinai, they, they step into relationship, into covenant with God. Yes, God, we will do anything. We'll do everything that you say for us to do. We'll do that. And God and the, the Jewish people enter into a, a beautiful covenantal relationship of commitment to one another to make the other better. And this is what they've broken. The very thing that God established them as a people and set them apart from the nations But now, as we look in on the Jewish people, they're not living this covenant any longer. They've replaced the covenant with a religion. And now they've become just like all of the nations that were around them. They weren't standing out. They weren't separate. And they didn't look different than the nations that were around them. So it's important as we start to look at these words in Amos 2 to understand why did God come to this spot, what was it that they were doing in breaking their covenant? How were they breaking their covenant? Specifically, what were the things that they were doing that broke the covenant that made God say, that's it, no more, the story is over, I'm finished dealing with you as a people. It's important for us to understand what they were doing specifically. Now, most of us are gonna think, well, it was because they were worshiping false gods, and and certainly they were worshiping false gods. In fact, that was in direct opposition of what God had said to them in the beginning. Don't worship other gods. Worship me alone, and don't even worship me like the other people worship their gods. Worship me completely different. This is a covenantal relationship. It looks different. Worship me differently. And so God uh, is for sure upset that they're worshiping false gods. But as we look at the words that Amos begins to say to the people of Israel, we hear very little about other gods. 
And we actually hear something else. As, as Amos is unfolding these accusations against Israel, it, it isn't what God's focusing on. Rather, he, we hear God zeroing in on something that we often skip over and we miss. Why was God's heart broken? Why was what the people were doing so detestable that God had had it? He was finished. It was over. And it was so wrong that God said, no more. I'm not going to continue to deal with you, people of Israel. It wasn't the false gods, necessarily. It was the way that they were treating other people. So listen to that very carefully. We're going to read through each one of those accusations just from chronologically from beginning kind of through the book of Amos. And we're going to highlight these are the things that God is accusing them of. He does mention false gods, but what he really focuses on is on how they're treating other people. This is Amos chapter 2. This is what the Lord says, For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. They sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son, use the same girl, and so profane my holy name. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. Part of their covenant said that if you take a garment in pledge from somebody else, you need to give that back to them until they can pay you back in case they don't have anything else to keep them warm. But we see that they were just taking everything for themselves without care of what was happening to the people that they were taking it from. In the house of their god, their little g-god, they drink wine taken as fines from other people. And then, speaking to the Philistines and the Egyptians in chapter 3, God says, Come, assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria and see the great unrest within her people, the oppression among her people. They do not know how to do right, declares the Lord. They, they who store up in their fortresses what they've plundered and looted from other people. In chapter 4, he continues to highlight their sin. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy, and say to your husbands, bring us a drink. Chapter 5, God specifically confronts their injustice that had now become a part of the culture to the point of it being commonplace. He says, There are those who turn justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground. There are those who hate the one who upholds justice in the courts and detest the one who tells the truth. You, you levy a tax, a straw tax on the poor and impose tax on their grain as if they have any money to pay the taxes. For I know how many are your offenses and how great are your sins. There are those who oppress the innocent and take bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. He states it clearly then in chapter 6 with this statement. You have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into bitterness. The message version says it this way. Listen to these words. You've made a shambles of justice, a bloated corpse of righteousness, bragging of your trivial pursuits, beating up on the weak and, crow and crowing, look what I've done. What we see taking place here is that many of the people of Israel are living a luxurious lifestyle they're, they're consuming lots and lots of food and wine and goods upon themselves at the cost and the expense of other people. There's not anything wrong with having a luxurious lifestyle as long as it isn't at the cost and the expense of other people. And in doing this, they're doing it while claiming to be spiritual people. We're God's people taking advantage of others with complete absence of justice. The very justice that God had written into their covenant that separated them and set them apart from all of the people of the world. There's complete 
lack of ju justice. It's gone. And now they're like the nations and the people around them, oppressing all of the people, especially those that were vulnerable, the poor and the needy, the helpless, the orphan, who couldn't change their situation. And they're doing it all for their own gain, selfishly and greedily taking it in on themselves. And it's important that we understand that this is how that they were violating God's covenant and breaking the intimacy that they had had between them and God by grinding others into the ground to build up their own lives, to live selfishly. And it was detestable to God because of who they were. He had found them when they were nothing. They were slaves and he delivered them out of slavery, and he gave them everything. He gave them the land of Canaan. They moved into houses and farms that weren't theirs, that were already built. He gave them everything. He gave them a name. He gave them relationship with him. And it wasn't enough. They're taking more from everybody else. They're crushing down the weak and the helpless to, to make themselves even more profitable. And God reminds them that it was him that delivered them out of slavery. It wasn't themselves. It was him that had made them strong when the nations of the, 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 the surrounding area came and attacked them. And he defeated those that were coming against them. It wasn't them. He reminds them that they weren't anything until he provided everything for them. And they likewise should do the same thing to those that are in their midst that are poor and are needy. Friends, it's very important then that we capture the idea that's being highlighted here for us because how we view and treat others is as important to God as how we worship and our devotion before him. In fact, John says it this way that the way that we show God that we love him is by loving other people. The actual way that we show God, I love you, God, is to love the persons that are around us. It's interesting, isn't it? Too often we think, I know I think, so I'm going to put us all in the same boat. Too often we think that our devotion to God our love of God, our commitment to God is somehow separate from the way that we respond to and treat and act towards other people. It's separate. I, I can act on Sunday with God one way, and then the guy that pulls in front of me on the road, I can act to him a whole different way. On Sunday, I can worship God, and on Wednesday, I can go into my, my prayer time with God. But then on Thursday, my neighbor who keeps harassing me, I can, have, I can let him know right where he's at. I can let him have it. It's getting really quiet in here. <laughs> See, this is, this is the grind. And this is what we have to capture. Israel believed the exact, the exact same thing. Amos highlights for us that the nation of Israel was very religious. They were very religious. They were going through all of the motions of being God's people outwardly and loving God with all of their actions, but without any heart changes inwardly, and so they were without loving any people. In fact, Amos speaks about their constant daily sacrifices and their free will offerings and their burnt offerings and their thank offerings and the consistency of their tithe giving. They weren't leaving anything out. They were doing it all. But then God says, I despise your religious festivals. Away with the noise of your songs and your music. It's detestable to me. All of that religious activity didn't add up to anything. To nothing. In fact, God hated it because they weren't loving other people. Their covenant, their love relationship with God had become a religion. 
It had become cold and calculated, complete with the list of do's and don'ts and rights and wrongs, and they were doing all of them perfectly, just like a contract. In fact, that's what a contract is. It isn't relationship. It's a, it's a contract. It's not a covenant. It's not a commitment. It's if I don't follow A, B, C, and D, then you can do B, C, D, and E, or something like that. And this is where we find these people. No heart, no relationship, and certainly no love. And we need to understand this so that we can be on our guard. Because religion, listen to this, religion and religiousness is just a few short steps away from relationship with God. I'm going to say that one more time. Religion and being religious is just a few short steps away from relationship with God. And this is what I mean. Religion is what I do when it's too hard for me to do the hard work of covenantal relationship. Covenantal relationship means I'm making a commitment to the other person. It means I'm giving of myself for the betterment of the other person. It means I'm sacrificing myself for the other person. It means I'm sticking with them thick or thin. Religion says, I'm not going to do all of that hard work. It's too much. I can't do it or I won't do it. So I'm just going to go through the motions like I'm doing it. Religion is God's covenant done my way. Religion is relationship with God set on cruise control. Religion allows me to worship God without any change taking place in my heart. Religion is the stuff that I do on the outside that makes it look like something's going on on the inside. The things that I wear or the things that I don't wear, a cross or a star, a hat or makeup or no makeup or a tattoo that says forgiveness or forgiven. It's the way I move when I worship, raising my hands. I grew up in a congregation where if you weren't raising your hands, you weren't worshiping God. And I learned how to do this for an hour and a half. Maybe it's the way I, I stand still as I'm worshiping God, or I bend and I bow and I twist and I turn. It's all on the surface trying to show what's happening here in my heart. Religion intentionally hides and blinds my deficits. Those things that, are, that I'm missing and lacking and covering up the messiness of my inner man with a facade of righteous-looking actions on the outside so that I don't have to do the hard work of allowing God to come in and clean up the messiness on the inside. Religion is God actions without God relationship. And then finally, religion always fosters an environment of entitlement where injustice can breed and grow. I want to say that one more time. Religion always fosters an environment of entitlement where, we, where injustice can breed and grow. Israel was living in an environment of entitlement. We're, we're God's people. We're the people of God. There is no other people of God. It's us alone. And they were living in this entitled environment. I call it the teacher's pet syndrome. It happened to me when I was in fifth grade. We had two classes that came together as one class for the fifth grade, and we had two teachers that were brand new. It was their first, both of them, believe it or not, were the first year teachers. And somehow I slid in there and I became the teacher's pet for both teachers. It's a great position. Because <laughs> you get all of the extra recess, you didn't have to worry if you were talking, that you didn't get in trouble. You got to go early to go to lunch. You got to do all the special errands for the teacher. It was a great place to be. But it's also a very dangerous place to be. 
So then the next year came along, sixth grade, new school, new teacher, and I'll never forget coming up to my teacher and I said, hey, hey, teach, can I go to the bathroom? She says, as she turns to me, Michael, my name is Miss Stockstill. I still remember her name. <laughs> my name is Miss Stockstill. And if you call me teach one more time, you're going to lose your recess. All right. Well, of course you have to test that, right? So a couple of days later, a couple of weeks later, I came in again. Hey, teach. Can I go to the bathroom? She turned again. Michael, my name is Miss Stockstill. You've just lost your recess. Entitlement is a dangerous place to be. And this is what we see taking place in Amos. Lots of religious activity going on, but the people couldn't see what they were doing wrong because they had blinded themselves with religion. And injustice had become the norm in this environment of entitlement. We're the people of God. We don't have to follow all the same rules as everybody else. We're different. We're special. We get special treatment around here. They thought that they were the teacher's pet. And because of that, they had created an environment of entitlement. And so God comes to his people like a good father would do. And he begins to bring them warnings of coming judgment through Amos. And specifically, we see in chapters 7 and 8 these five visions of coming judgment that, that God begins to speak to his people in love, warning them as much as he's telling them it's going to happen, hoping, I believe, that they would turn their hearts, but they don't. And he begins to give these, these visions to Amos, and Amos is sharing them with the people. The first two visions scare Amos so badly because of the destruction and the judgment that's going to happen to the people of Israel, that he says to God, one by one, he says, God, don't, don't do that. He begins to intercede for his people. God, if you do that, you're going you're gonna to destroy them. You're going to wipe them out. So God says, one by one, after the first vision, okay, I, I won't do it. After the second vision, okay, I, I won't do it. And we see that God listens to the prayers of Amos and, and his intercession for the people. But then we get to the third vision where we're going to spend a little bit of time tonight. And God simply says, because my people are so far out of alignment, I'm going to spare them no longer. That's it. I'm done. It's over. It's going to happen. Amos 7 says this, And the Lord asked me, What do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, Look, I'm setting a plumb line among my people, Israel. I will spare them no longer. It's over. They're out of alignment. They're not measuring up to any of my standards or my covenant with them. It's finished. I'm not going to listen to any more intercession. So a plumb line. Some of us don't know what a plumb line is. A plumb line is a measuring instrument that's still even used till today in many places in the world. And it's used by builders to give them a straight line so that they know what their building really is in line, that it's straight, that it's going from the bottom to the top perfectly uh, vertical up. And, and it's a measurement, it's a measurement tool that's used to create perfectness. And God says, I'm setting my perfectness, my measurement, down among my people. And they're out of line. They're out of alignment. Lots of us have had this building experience where we're trying to, to build a closet uh, in a row, or we're trying to put shelves up or lay carpet down and, and we're measuring with our eye and we're kind of doing one of these things with our thumb and we're trying to get the right, and, and, and it's deceptive because our eye lies to us. The environment around makes it look like it's straight, but then it isn't straight. And we've put all this work into it. I'll never forget a few years back, I decided I was going to put some shelves into our bomb shelter room. It was a little room that, 
set off of our kitchen. And so I was going to make it so that we could store stuff in there in case we had to spend lots of time in there. And then we used it kind of like our pantry. So I spent lots of time and, and, and energy and put together all the materials. And then I measured and I measured and I measured every single angle you could possibly think of to figure out where to put my braces and to make sure that they were in alignment. And then I, I drew the holes and then I spent hours drilling into solid cement. I'm guaranteeing you, you don't want to do this. It's a foolish move, but I was committed. So I'm <laughs> drilling hole after hole into <laughs> solid cement. And, and finally, I get the holes there, and I put the anchors in, put the braces on the wall, and I am a happy guy. And then I put the brackets in, and I'm going to put my shelves on, and, and everything's going great until I put the shelves on. And they're like this. <laughs> every single shelf. And I stood there going, how did that happen? I measured till I thought I was going to go crazy. I measured and I measured and I measured. But I was using the wrong measurement. Because I finally measured the floor from on this side of the room from the floor to the ceiling. And then I came over to this side of the room and I measured the floor to the ceiling and it was off about that much. <laughs> the floor was wrong. I was using the wrong measurement. And this is what we see with God's people. They were using the wrong measurement. They had replaced God's standard for measuring our lives, namely how we treat other people in this covenant relationship with God, and they'd replaced it with their own standards. They were still measuring, but they were using their standards. So there wasn't true measurement taking place. They'd replaced God's true measurement with what was convenient for them, what felt good for them. They were replacing God's standard with what allowed them to fit in with the nations that were around them. They didn't want to look too different. And ultimately, they were replacing God's true measure with what made them better what made their lives better. Unfortunately, we still do the same thing today. Removing God's measurement from our lives, we choose different standards and we measure ourselves by the people that are around us or by the standards of the people that are around us or by the standards of the culture around us. We use all different kinds of measurements instead of God's measurement for our lives. And this is the first earmark of becoming religious. We quit using God's standards because they require that we really have to change. And that's hard. We replace his standard of measurement with our own standards, which allows us some wiggle room. It gives us some, some freedom to, to serve God, but to serve God our way and to do God what's best for us. This is a dangerous, dangerous place to be. Paul even warns us in 1 Corinthians that all of these things that happened to the Jewish people happened to them as examples for us because we're just like them. And we're not exempt from the rules just like them. So all of these things that we see in Amos, they're examples to us. It's a warning to us. Paul goes on to say, if you think that you're standing firm, if you have that entitlement mentality, be careful that you don't fall. I'm God's person. I have a, co I have a calling on my life. Me and God, we got this thing going. I, I hate to say it, but I'm, I'm, God's, I'm God's special pet. He really likes me. He does everything for me. I have a little bit more wiggle room with God than, than you do because I have a calling on my life. Or I, I'm doing so many amazing things for God. He's given me some little, a little bit of wiggle room over here. I, I don't have to follow those same rules. See, I just healed 16 people over here. So I, I don't have to follow this set of rules over here. I just spent three hours in the prayer tower. 
three hours. God's pretty happy with me. And, I, and actually, he's going to give me a little bit of grace over here. So I don't have to kind of follow that, that rule, that one about how I'm treating these people over here. I just spent three hours in the prayer tower. They didn't. I know they didn't. See, how we treat other people, all people, but especially those that can't help themselves, really indicates what's going on in our hearts. Said very precisely, how we treat other people is God's plumb line in our lives. This is the measurement that God uses to clearly indicate what's in our hearts. If there's right and straight and true standards of godliness in our lives, it isn't how long we spend in the prayer tower. It's not what kind of clothes we wear. It's not how many services that we go to every week. It's not how long you read your Bible. Those things do not impress God. They don't communicate to God, ah, they love me. What communicates love to God? It's when I love other people. Then God goes, wow, wow, look at that. That person loves me. Look at the way they're treating that that homeless guy. Look at the way that they're treating that person at work that's driving them nuts. They love me because they're loving that person. And I know that person's hard to love. Yeshua put it all together when he was asked by the expert in the law, the expert who perceived himself to be the expert in godly measurements, what's the greatest command? Yeshua simply states what the covenant love relationship looks like. We all know it. Love, he starts out, love the Lord your God with all your mind with all your heart, with all, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord your God. And then, as you're doing that, and then, in addition to that, love your neighbor as yourself. That's covenant relationship. John clarifies this even more when he says, Dear children, let us not love with words and speech, but with actions and with truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth if we love other people. This is God's plumb line measurement in our lives. This is how we know we love God. And it's what God uses to see what's in our hearts, how we're loving other people. So some people might ask, this is the big question, how, so how, how do I love other people? What is God's standards. I've heard this teaching and I've heard that teaching. What, what, what is the way? What is God's standard? And, and the answer is really simple. This, this is God's standard right here. And he says it in lots of different ways in lots of different places. But we're going to read just one of those ways tonight. This is Paul's letter to the Ephesians in chapter 5. And, and he's speaking to these brand new believers about what it looks like to be in covenantal love relationship with God. So he begins in chapter 5. I'm reading it from the message version simply so that we can hear God's heart behind the instruction, so that we can hear the words a little bit differently and grab a hold of the heart behind the commands. This is what Paul says, to the Ephesians, watch what God does and then you do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Now, mostly what God does is love you. So keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Yeshua loved us. His love was not cautious but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. Don't allow love to turn into lust, setting off a downhill slide into sexual promiscuity, filthy practices, or bullying greed. That's exactly what was going on in Amos. 
Though some tongues just love the taste of gossip, those who follow Yeshua have better uses for language than that. Don't talk dirty or silly. Talk th that kind of talk doesn't fit our lifestyle. Thanksgiving is our dialect. You can be sure that using people or religion or things just for, where, just for what you're going to get out of them, the usual variations of idolatry will get you nowhere and certainly nowhere near the kingdom of Yeshua, the kingdom of God. Don't let yourselves be taken in by religious smooth talk. God gets furious with people who are full of religious sales talk but want nothing to do with him. Don't even hang around people like that. This is what we compare our, our lives to. This scripture is just one of many, many that is God's plumb line, if you will, of how we are to treat other people, how we're to love him by the way we treat other people. It's that covenantal relationship with God, and it's, it's that plumb line that we want to line our hearts up with, that we want to line our lives up with. And, and right our wrongs, especially when it comes to the way that we see and treat other people. This is God's plumb line, what we just got through reading in Ephesians. And really, this is the instruction book on how to do it. God's word. This week we were speaking with our staff and we were, a couple weeks ago, talking about this idea of revival. And it's a, it's a topic that I personally get excited about and a lot of other believers get excited about this idea of revival and, and what's going on and, and when are people going to come into relationship with the Lord worldwide? What's that going to look like? And, and what, what is the body of Yeshua going to look like when that happens? And as we were talking through this idea of revival, um, it, it came, became real that revival isn't something that takes place out there. Real revival, the kind that's going to change the world, is revival that starts right here with me. As I line myself up with God's plumb line and I begin to love Him with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and then because I'm loving Him, I have the capacity to love other people. His love infused in my life, flowing out of my life, gives me the ability to love other people. That's where revival starts. And then as I'm loving other people, as it's flowing out of me and touching the people that are in my life, in my world, then war revival happens out there. That's how revival takes place. And we can't keep waiting for revival to just happen out there. It has to start here. And we want to start revival right here. This is what God is putting his finger on. We're not special because we live in Jerusalem. We're not special because we have a calling over our lives. We have to follow the same rules and step into the same hard work of allowing God to clean up our inside mess as everybody else. And it starts right here with internal revival as we line our hearts and our lives up with God's plumb line, with his word. So this is a challenging message, and I know it is, because it really challenged me. And so we need to do business with God before we leave this place tonight. Each and every one of us, there's nobody exempt here, because we all have to deal with other people as we worship our God we have to deal with other people and what's in our hearts. So as the worship leader comes and they begin to lead us in worship, I'm going to invite our, our wonderful prayer team to come down and to fill the front. And let, let's stand. And I'm going to pray for us and then our worship team will lead us into to some prayer. And then I'm going to invite you to come down and, and specifically get prayer for this area of our lives, that our, that our hearts, that your heart that my heart would line up with God's plumb line and that God would expose to us those areas where we're out of balance, 
before we put the braces on the wall and we have to redo the work. And so, God, we ask that your spirit would come and move, us, move among us now. We're your people. We love you. We thank you for the calling on each and every one of our lives. God, we thank you for the opportunity to walk with you in this world and to represent you among the nations of the world. But God, we need to know how to love those that you've placed around us. Can I just confess for all of us, God, that we're out of alignment. We need your plumb line to drop down among us tonight and to line our hearts up with you. Show us how to love with all of our heart and our mind and our strength and show us how to love those that you've put in our lives. Come and dwell among us now, Yeshua, and be exalted in our presence as we worship you and as we line our hearts up with you. We say, Amen. Yeshua's name. 